Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. You're about to listen to a historical episode of Dark Poutine. After episode 149, you will find Scott is no longer with the show. In an effort to maintain continuity and offer listeners as many episodes as possible, we are leaving the episodes in which he co-hosted intact. Thank you. Welcome to Dark Poutine. I'm Mike Brown, creator and host. With me as usual is my good friend and co-host, Scott Hemingway. Say hello, Scott. Hello, my wonderful listening family. Well, there you go. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Some listeners will find our content intense. We're not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We're two ordinary Canadian schmoes (laughs) chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. Jump, jump, jump. Listeners who feel they are in crisis can contact the Crisis Text Line in Canada by texting HOME to 686868. In the US or UK, text 741741. The service will match you with a volunteer counsellor who is supervised by a licensed, trained mental health professional. Crisis Text Line is free 24-7 support for those in crisis. For more information, go to crisistextline.ca in Canada or crisistextline.org globally. Let's get on with the show. Please. We have not covered many stories that take place in Saskatchewan. So this I was is true. So I was looking for one. And I remembered a book that a listener had sent me mm-hmm. and decided to see if anything stood out there. Oh, I was hoping there wouldn't be anything else because I just, I've lived under this impression that uh, Saskatchewan is just this utopia. Look uh, at of, McLean's. North Battleford is number one most crime ridden city in Canada. I thought that was Thunder Bay. No. The book called Moose Jaw Murders and Other Deaths was written by Bruce Ferriman, and in it are stories of crimes in Moose Jaw, ranging from 1885 to 2003. There were two chapters near the back of the book involving the subjects of today's show that grabbed me and drew me in. Like, Mm -hmm. I was just like, whoa, this is a really crazy story. Oh, wow. In this episode, we learn about a man who went from young offender to dangerous offender Whoa. in only six years. Whoa. Yeah. It's a quick progression. You are listening to Dark Poutine episode 141, Dangerous Offender, The Crimes of Jacob Green. That's a familiar name, but no, I think it's it just a, co- I think it's just because it's a common green. Yeah. I've known a lot of greens. Yeah, right. We've mentioned Moose Jaw, the little city with the odd name in the show a few times yeah. recently. Most recently in episode 135, what happened to Dylan Koshman? According to the city's website, the name Moose Jaw comes from a Cree name for the place Muscani Sipi, meaning warm place by the river. Oh. The first two syllables, Mosca, sound remarkably like Moose Jaw. So that's where it comes from. So it's just because it sounded like. Right. Wow. Okay. That's how we're naming things now, is it? I guess so. Okay. The city of around 33,000 is a 230 kilometer drive just a little bit south of Saskatoon. The old Sonny James song, look it up. A little bit so Saskatoon. Made popular by uh, Slapshot, the movie. I'm not going to look it up. But okay, oh, oh my God, Slapshot. In the McLean's Magazine 2020 list of Canada crime ratings, Moose Jaw places 32nd overall. Oh. 
Nowhere near the number one spot held by that other city in Saskatchewan, North Battleford. Moose Jaw's past, though, is quite another story. Part of it involves the world's most infamous gangster, Al Capone. What? He was rumored to have a network of rum-running tunnels beneath the city during Prohibition times in the United States. What? The city has even officially embraced their dark history, calling themselves Canada's most notorious city on their website at moosejaw.ca. Don't believe me? Here's the audio from a video made recently by the city, starring its mayor, Fraser Tolmy. Oh, I'm curious. Hi, I'm Fraser Tolmy, mayor of Moose Jaw. Canada's most notorious city. What makes us notorious? Our name? Absolutely. Moose Jaw. Moose Jaw. Trying to read the card here. Moose Jaw says Catchabot. Our moose? <laughs> Definitely. Norway and Canada are fighting <laughs> over who has the world's tallest moose statue. For many, it's our legendary underground past. It's notoriously imperfect, and it's helped shape who we are. But to Moose Javians, we're so much more. Notoriously charming. Moose Jaw is notoriously generous. Notoriously entrepreneurial. Notoriously entertaining. We are unafraid to celebrate our past and roar into the 2020s towards a notoriously prosperous future. So join us for a day, a week, or a lifetime in the place that is absolutely, positively, Canada's most notorious city. Welcome to Moose Jaw. So, 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 so a few things there. Okay. Mayor has a faux hawk. If people in the audience can't see that. They because can't. Because this is uh, audio. That's why I'm helping them. No, the, uh, the link will be there for them. For sure. Uh, so he has a faux hawk. So yep. that right there is a great start. Mm-hmm. Uh, saw no mountains in that video. No, because it's a scandal. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Well-crafted video. It does make me want to go there. Al Capone murals. There were Al Capone murals on walls. Yep. They really have embraced the notorious component. There you go. Yes. And it sounds to me like I should have actually overnighted there. Um, rather it, than just driven by. It actually made, I kind of really do want to go there after yeah. that video. I'm like, sure, yeah. okay. You know, I maybe, I don't know if, I don't know if it's notoriously entertaining. I don't know that part. I'm, it's not, I, you know, I've heard things about Moose Jaw. I've never maybe, had anybody. Maybe Nickelback will play this. <laughs> I've, I've never heard anybody be like, you got to go there. It is so entertaining, Scott. The first significant events in this story took place in the early morning hours of June 27th in 1993. Police responded to a frantic call made by 62-year-old female at the tiny bungalow at 883 Number 7 Avenue Northeast in Moose Jaw. Police arrived at the home to find the woman covered in her boyfriend's blood. Yikes. Kenneth John Ladubik, 46, was lying dead on the bedroom floor in a large pool of his own blood. The man appeared to have been stabbed in the neck. The woman identified herself as Susanna Green. Susanna said that she had been awakened briefly and seen her 16-year-old son Jake leaving the bedroom only moments before Kenneth had fallen on top of her, choking and gurgling, his eyes wide and hands over his gushing wound. She didn't realize what was going on until she turned on the lights. Holy schnitzel, that's a lot of gushing. Right. Which, I mean, explains the very bloody scene. You're right. Wow. Police found Jacob Leroy Andrew Green at a neighbor's home. He had run there after the stabbing and had been standing in the window watching the situation unfold as police and other emergency personnel arrived back at his home. They took Jake into custody and held him until his arraignment days later. When he was charged with first-degree murder, Jake cried in the witness box. He would be tried as a young offender. That's really uh, quite a concerning uh, situation. I mean, clearly, it looks like he stabbed him. And then to be across the street watching... As all of this panic is happening around what you've caused, but with him crying in the witness. Well, it's not like he did it and then was like, I'm going to not moose jaw. Right. Jake seemed like an average kid at first. He was active and did well in school, maintaining an average of around 85%. But things went sideways. 
After Jake's older brother, whom he idolized, died in 1989, his parents' relationship soured. Mm. Jake questioned whether his older brother had died by accident or by suicide. Mm. Jake's mother was drinking, and when Jake was 13, they divorced. Soon after, Susanna Green took up with Ken Ledubic, and in 1991, Ken moved in with Susanna and her two remaining children. Jake's grades and attitude took a real nosedive at that point. Which, I mean, yeah, that's a pretty substantial event to have happen in, mm-hmm. Two. in, in one, a child's one, life. Two. Su- a suicide. Suicide of a brother. And then yep. a divorce. Or death. But yeah, uh, yeah, and ad- yeah, those yeah. are like two incredibly impactful things to have happen at that age, or any age. Jake had a challenging relationship with his mom's live-in boyfriend, Kenneth Ledubik, in the months before the older man's death. Jake did not like Ken, as he and Susanna argued a lot and some things... Sometimes things got physically violent. On one occasion, during a verbal altercation between Kenneth and Susanna, Ledubic had shoved her down onto the couch, badly bruising the woman's back. When Susanna showed Jake the bruises, Jake was livid and told his mom that Ken better not do that again. Jake always wanted to stick up for Susanna when she and Kenneth fought, but she would ask Jake to back off and mind his business. Yeah, I mean, I can only imagine how difficult that would be watching your mom get physically assaulted Mm -hmm. and and the the urge to want to try to put an end to it. Right. But Ledubic was a big guy, too. Oh, yeah? And and Jake was not. Uh. When Ken was upset with others, sometimes he took things out on Jake. One time, apparently telling the teen, I'll kill you one of these days. Fuck. About 18 months before Kenneth's death, there was a violent encounter between the two. Susanna had told Jake to get up and do some chores around the house the next morning. That morning, Jake was still in bed and wouldn't get up for Susanna, who was yelling at him. Frustrated, Susanna complained to Ledubic, who decided he would take care of it and went to Jake's bedroom in the basement. Oh, I don't see this going well. Only moments later, Susanna heard a commotion downstairs, two raised male voices and crashing and banging. Susanna ran down and burst into the bedroom just in time to see Kenneth, a really large man, with his hands around her smaller son's throat. Oh, shit. She yelled for Kenneth to let go of Jake, but he would not. Susanna ran to a neighbor's home to seek assistance. The neighbor tried to talk some sense into Kenneth, but Kenneth only released Jake after the teen kicked the older man, stunning him, which loosened his grip. Jake had angry, deep purple bruises on his throat for days after the incident and was fuming about Kenneth. That kind of dysfunction is so sad. Mm -hmm. And and I can understand the passion on all sides, but you never, never put your hands on a kid. In my opinion, whether it is trying to discipline, no, you never put your hands on a kid, especially choking a kid. Yeah. Yeah. You're supposed to be the bigger person and have better ways of problem resolving. One hopes. One hopes, exactly. On the evening of June 26, 1993, hours before Kenneth Ledubik's murder, after a night of drinking and playing cards with Susanna and friends, Ken confronted Jake as the boy was watching a movie he had rented. Ken was upset that Jake had not finished the chores he had been asked to do that day and berated him, calling him lazy. (sighs) Ken told the teen to go to bed as he had to get up early the next morning to finish what was not done. Ken then assigned more work around the property on top of what was incomplete and stormed out of Jake's room. Jake continued watching the movie. Ken came back ten minutes later, still fuming. He was livid that Jake had not gone to bed and screamed at Jake that if the boy was not awake early, according to Moose Jaw Murders, Ledubic would, quote, wake him up his way. Ken stomped off again after a loud argument with Susanna. They both went to bed. His way. Hmm. Jake was distracted and angry. He finished the movie. He laid down, but he couldn't sleep. Jake claimed that he could not stop thinking about what Ken had said to him. He knew that if he did not wake up on time, Jake risked being throttled again. And Jake also feared he may not get in a lucky shot this time and could end up being choked to death. Yeah. Jake was sick of the daily verbal abuse that his mother's boyfriend heaped onto him since moving in two years before, but worse, the physical and verbal abuse Kenneth doled out to Susanna. He had hurt her, and Jake hated that. Ledubic had even threatened to kill Jake's sister's cat. That's when Jake decided he needed to do something about Ken Ledubic. 
it's so difficult to comment on because knowing what happened, um, you, you want to empathize with the kid because mm -hmm. you, you can feel cornered. I can understand right. that you're watching this violence on a daily basis, afraid that you may be killed. Uh, and who do you go to? Because you're supposed to be able to go to your parents. Right. You're supposed to be able to talk it out. But as a kid, you can feel very trapped. So I, I can understand how one might feel like they need to lash out to protect themselves. But in the same vein, you, 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 don't, you don't do that. You don't stab somebody. So Jake took the stand at his trial. The judge wrote about the boy's testimony. Mm. Quote, his evidence was that he wanted to do something to scare Ken so much that he would leave the house and not return. Jake didn't want to wake his mom because she would just stop him as she had in other confrontations with Ken. He wasn't certain how to do this until he reached the top of the stairs. Jake decided to use a knife. He got his weapon from a kitchen cupboard and approached the closed master bedroom door. There, he says, after about 15 seconds of listening for noise, he, in his words, chickened out. He retreated to the bathroom and again, in his words, quote, got some nerve. Hmm. He then entered the darkened bedroom, aided by the light from the bathroom and light coming in the bedroom window. He went to Mr. Ledubik's side of the bed and put the knife tip up against the side of his neck, hovering over him holding on to the knife with both hands because his hands were shaking. Jake spoke to Ken, saying, Wake up! Wake up, Ken! And the man opened his eyes. At this point, Jake says he panicked and thrust the knife into Ken Ledubik's neck. Yeah, um, I don't buy it. Why not? Um, there's a lot more premeditation in there than reacting in a moment. Um, do I believe that he was trying to put an end to the violence in the household? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, but he murdered him mm. and intentionally murdered him. It wasn't self-defense in the moment. There were other ways to handle it, such as the authorities and such. Jake did contradict himself several times mm -hmm. in his statements. For example, Jake told the police that he was unaware that he had hurt Ken. But the neighbors whose house Jake had run to minutes after the attack said the young man had told them he had stabbed Ledubik. Yep. The single wound on Ken Ledubik's neck was deep. A lot of force would have been necessary to achieve that depth. Again, from court documents, quote, The medical evidence from the autopsy of Dr. Valerio shows that the knife penetrated five inches into Mr. Ledubik's neck, the knife missed the jugular vein on the left side, but severing it on the right side, causing massive bleeding that led to Mr. Ledubik's death in about 10 minutes or less. Whew, five inch uh, deep stab wound on the throat. Necks aren't that thick. No. So five inches is deep. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Lori Carlson, a psychologist, assessed Jake to determine his mental state. What she found was disturbing. Mm. Carlson testified at Jake's trial. She said that Jake was not remorseful for killing Ken Ledubik and that Jake possessed only primitive social skills. Jake, it turns out, had a history of bullying and was aggressive. Okay. He had, quote, a blatant disregard for social conventions and was given to hostile, arrogant, and provocative interpersonal behaviors, evincing indifference toward the welfare of others. Jake also had an entrenched belief system for closing appreciation of the wrong he had done in killing the man. She suggested he was, quote, likely to engage in further impulsive criminal behavior should he feel the need, as he perceived it, to defend his honor or that of his family. So whether it was real or not, if he felt the anger, he would do potentially something about do yeah. something like yeah. this again. Yeah, so the plot thickens. Okay. Jake's earlier tears in the courtroom were more likely for himself than for what he had just done to Ken. Yeah, okay, now it makes sense. On December 3rd, 1993, Judge King found Jacob Leroy Andrew Green guilty of the lesser offense of manslaughter. Later that month, Jake was sentenced to one month close custody, which he had already served leading up to the trial. He would spend 18 more months in open custody to be served at a Salvation Army-run facility in Regina. 
That was to be followed up with 17 months of probation and a 10-year supervision order. So wow. you, you're making faces over there. Yes, I am. So what, what, why are you making faces? Explain that. Oh, I, I understand uh, the difference between being a juvenile and an adult and why we right. have a different sen- sentencing. And I support it and I agree with it. But even still, that sounds pretty light. Right. It sounds incredibly light. One month of essentially closed custody. One month month of jail, which he had already served. Yes. Yeah. So his punishment was to stay at a Salvation Army where he's going to be supervised. Yeah. And like that, then some probation and then supervision. Especially with yeah. when you're hearing the concerns of the psychiatrist mm-hmm. and what the psychiatrist posed to the court, it seems extremely like a light sentence. And I'm not saying they should have locked him up for years or whatever, but it seems like there should have been more qualifiers when you've got, this guy killed somebody. The professionals say he's likely to potentially do that again. Right. Maybe have some more qualifiers in there for people's safety. Well, guess what? Jake's sentence was appealed by the crown who felt it was too lenient. Yes. Crown. In June of 1994, the honorable Mr. Justice Cameron, the honorable Madam Justice Gerwing, and the Honorable Mr. Justice Lane released their decision. Jake was not responding well in the Salvation Army home. Tough tutus. The judges wrote that the most severe issue apparent was Jake's failure to realize the seriousness of his crime. That's what we're talking about. To Jake, it was still Ken's own fault that he was dead. Even after six months in open custody and counseling, Jake did not accept personal responsibility for the slaying. Jake followed the rules of the house, but that was pretty much where his compliance ended. He showed, quote, no abandonment of his attitude, end quote, (sighs) and maintained killing his mother's boyfriend was an appropriate response to Ken's threatening behavior. They recommended more counseling and agreed with Crown's petition for a stiffer sentence, adjusting it to include 15 months in a closed custody at a locked young offenders facility. Better. That was to be followed by nine months of probation and the 10-year supervision order would stand as ordered by the first judge. They feared that were a similar situation to arise, real or not, Mm -hmm. if Jake perceived the threat, he might handle it in precisely the same way. And that's exactly the concern that I was expressing is that in all likelihood with the treatment and everything that had been given to him, yeah, it seems very likely that a situation like this could very well happen again with ease. And I I get that you can't, it's not my minority report. You can lock somebody up because. Where they they think. Yeah, for what they think or what potentially might happen. Well, he's manslaughtered (laughs) somebody. It's homicide. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He has committed a homicide. Yes, he is responsible for somebody's death. Yeah. Um, But, so I get get that you can't just be like, well, we're afraid he might do it again. Let's keep him locked up longer. But uh, it, they, There just needs to be a better way to manage an individual like him. Jake's troubles continued after his release. You don't say. He was suspended multiple times from school and finally expelled. He went back to the Young Offenders Open Facility in Regina after that and lived there until 1996. After that, Jake lived with his mom again briefly before moving in with his girlfriend. According to the story in Moose Jaw Murders, the young woman passed away from cystic fibrosis while Jake was away working in Medicine Hat. Mm. Now, that's pretty sad. That is sad. Jake's psychopathy remained relatively in check until in 1999 it boiled over again and another family was hurt. Oh, God. And we'll take a break right here. If you're looking for a smoking gun, I can absolutely guarantee you, you will not find it. In October 2001, a series of letters filled with a deadly powder called anthrax were dropped into the U.S. mail system. What started as an unprecedented case turned into an unsettling mystery. Who sent these deadly letters and why? From Campside Media and Sony Music Entertainment, I'm Josh Dean, and this is Cover Up Season 4, The Anthrax Threat. Available now. And we're back. Thoughts so far, Scott? Mike, you've put me on a roller coaster of emotions. Right. I, I started off with empathy. Yeah. Uh, this poor kid. That's Bullied. If, mm-hmm. uh, you know, he was uh, 
a victim. He suffered traumas, a victim. But of he made assault. a very adult decision. Well, but that's the, that's, that, that's the roller coaster. Because right? then I got mad, Mike. Yeah. I got yeah. mad that he killed, he murdered, he and, did. and then he didn't feel remorse. Yeah. But he got convicted. Phew. But then it was a light sentence. Right. Oh, and then they improved the sentence. Phew. But now he's back on the streets. Huh? Yeah. Roller coaster. 22-year-old Jacob Green met Leslie Yaremko, 20, through a mutual friend on August 21, 1999. At this time, Jake was working on the killing floor at the Western Canadian Beef Packers, WCB plant in Moose Jaw, and that plant would process about 180,000 animals per year. You're making a face again. Yeah, I think anytime your job descriptor is working on the killing floor. I just go right to... Uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Oh, my God, yes. Right? But, it, like, if job description, like, oh, where do you work? I work on a killing floor. If you have to say killing floor in regards to your job, maybe... There are other... There are actual job. serial killers who have worked in slaughterhouses and killing floors. I'm not surprised. And it desensitized them to doing what they had to do. Well, I just... I don't want the word killing associated to anything I do. No. You know, it's just, yeah. I think that's one of my rules, Mike. I don't know about you. Right. But it's one of my rules. Uh, Leslie Remco, she was on medical leave from her job where she worked as a conductor for the Canadian Pacific Railway, CPR. Mm -hmm. She was dealing with Crohn's disease. Leslie and Jake dated, drinking in bars with friends over the next few weeks. A lot of people struggling in this guy's life. Yeah. It's interesting how he's attracted to two women yeah. who both had... Um, Serious illnesses. Is, yeah, yeah, they were in, in a sort of a serious state. Yes, in, in need of help and assistance. Jake seemed nice for a short while, but then he started to get possessive, jealously demanding more attention from Leslie. Okay. And this is where this comes in, this illness thing with his girlfriends. Maybe he liked women who were compromised in some way because he had such low self-esteem, he thought he needed somebody who needed him. Just, that's exactly where I was going. He wanted to feel needed right. and special. And I think also a sense of, well, yeah, it just he, he wanted to feel needed. You uh, said that. Yeah, I know. That's why I'm just like <laughs> rambled and then went back to, yes, that. Oh. He wanted to feel needed. <laughs> According to Moose Jaw Murders, at one point, Leslie told Jake that she felt it was not safe to date someone like him. She had heard about his past. Mm -hmm. Jake was upset, and he replied, quote, If you have a problem with my past, the relationship is over. And at that point, she said, Perfect. Have a good life. No, she did not. Ah, damn it. Leslie was in Winnipeg for treatment for her Crohn's on two separate occasions over the summer and the fall of 1999. So the first was in August, just after they had met, mm -hmm. and then for two weeks again. And Jake was irritated with her because she was only supposed to be gone for one week in October, but her dad couldn't come pick her up. So he was PO'd because his girlfriend couldn't be back there giving him the attention that he needed. Yeah, yeah. Right? And, and I'm sure with the looming Y2K threat, there was a lot of anxiety going sure. around for everybody. Like I said, he wanted all of her time. And he called her every day that she was away. Oh, this, this is desperate. Sounds pretty needy. It also sounds like young me in that sense. Well, I get to that too. <laughs> on Leslie's return from Winnipeg on Friday, September 24th, 1999, she and Jake went out drinking with friends at a local bar. As the night progressed, Jake began arguing with Leslie that she was talking too much with her friends, in particular... In particular, he was jealous of her ongoing conversation with another young man there. Oh, my God. As Jake and Leslie fought, the other man interjected, which enraged oh Jake. My, oh, boy. Jake challenged the other man to, to a fight, embarrassing Leslie. Leslie and Jake left the bar. Outside, Leslie told Jake that the stress of their relationship was causing her Crohn's to flare up painfully, and she told him that she wanted to break up. Jake stormed off. And Leslie went back inside. Good on you, Leslie. Jake reappeared a few minutes later, no. apologizing to the man he'd challenged and begged to talk with Leslie. She turned him away. She told him to call her the next day after she had a chance to calm down. 
And Jake stalked off again. That, that's a rational way to approach things for her. I mean, that is a, one of the more healthy ways mm -hmm. to react in a very heated moment is to say, let's walk away yeah. and let our, our brains chill. And then let's, let's re. So uh, his behavior to this point, uh, I have written here so far, this sounds a lot like several of the relationships I had around that age. Yep. Same. I was a jealous, angry, needy guy. Yeah. Yeah. Peas in a pod here. Yeah. 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 I, I completely relate to that except for the murdering parts and stuff. Right. Jake waited until the next day to call Leslie at her family's home at 38 Daisy Crescent. In the conversation that lasted around 90 minutes, Leslie reiterated her decision to end things. Jake begged her to take him back, but Leslie stayed firm. She wanted out. Their discussion became heated and Jake finally exclaimed, so you won't take me back? Leslie said no. Jake ended the conversation by stating, fine, have it your way, and slammed the phone down without saying goodbye. Jake did call back again a few minutes later, but hung up without saying a word when Leslie answered, and he didn't call back that day. What a stupid, like, fine, have it your way, because he is, great, that's what she wants. Perfect, thank you. Exactly. Like, how is that supposed to be like... What a relief. Eh, yeah, eh. like, I'll show you, have it your way. Thank you for showing me. That night, another young man named Andrew McQuarrie, who had known Leslie and her family for more than 10 years, spent mm -hmm. the night. Andrew also worked at WCB with Jake Green. Terry Uremko, 47, Leslie's dad, and her mom, Sharon, 44, wished the two good night and went to bed. Leslie and Andrew stayed up till 4 or 5 a.m. chatting. Leslie then went to her bedroom in the basement, and Andrew crashed on the couch in the basement rec room. You know, I totally understand that. Staying up till four. Like, what a, a heated thing. She's probably got a lot to vent. She wants to unload. She needs and, a good friend to just unload Yeah, and I'm with. sure, like, you know, he's probably, I completely relate. I had, yeah, yeah. I, th what are you going to, what else do you expect? Yeah. On Sunday morning, September 26, 1999, at 8 a.m., the Yaremko's dogs were barking like crazy, mm -hmm. as they usually did when someone knocked at the door. Terry got up, put on his bathrobe, and walked down the hall to see who was at the door. Oh he peered out to see that it was Jake Green. Terry and Sharon Yaremko had met Green when Leslie brought him over in the first week of their five-week-long relationship. That so was, it was only it? it was only five weeks. Holy shit. Terry was also well aware that it was over between Jake and his daughter. Terry opened the door. Jake told him he'd left his gym keys downstairs in the basement. Knowing that Leslie probably didn't want to see Jake, Terry offered to go downstairs to get Jake's keys. Mm -hmm. When Terry turned his back on Jake oh, and God. started walking toward the basement door, Jake pounced on him and started savagely stabbing the older man with one of three knives oh, he had brought with him. God. Jake was not done. After Jake stabbed Terry in the back, he fell to the floor. Jake was on top of Terry, stabbing him 24 times in a frenzied attack. Oh, my God. Jake, angrily cursing as he went about his business, stabbed Terry in his face, ear, chest, back, in his hands as the man was lying on the floor. Oh, and shit. at one point I read in Moose Jaw Murders, it appeared, Terry thought that Jake was trying to stab him through the head with the knife, like Hold, through so his ear. The velocity that must mm -hmm. have been in those. Uh, right. Oh. Jake stood and kicked Terry Uremko in the face as hard as he could, knocking one tooth out and loosening another. Oh. Terry was groaning in pain. As well, he was losing lots of blood and was close to being unconscious. Sharon heard the commotion and raced out into the hallway. She saw Terry lying on the floor. There was blood everywhere, but she could not see anyone else. Oh. Terry croaked out, Call the police. I've just been attacked. Sharon ran back into the bedroom and she dialed 911. Jake Green then appeared out of nowhere. He had been hidden in the entryway behind the wall. Jake rushed into Sharon's room, grabbed her around the neck, and started stabbing Sharon. He stabbed her in the back and face, then slashed her throat four times. Oh my God. Leslie, awakened by the barking dogs, came upstairs from her bedroom in the basement. She was shocked to see Jake standing there. Her father was lying bloodied on the floor. Leslie cried out, What are you doing to my daddy? Oh. Then she saw a knife in Jake's hand. Knowing she was in trouble, she started to make a run for it. Jake caught up with her in the kitchen and slammed Leslie's face hard down onto the stove. 
and then he began to stab her. There's such violence. While Leslie was on her feet, Jake stabbed her 33 times in the back and on the top of her head, her neck, shoulder, and hands. When she fell to the floor, Jake stabbed her three more times. Oh. Jake told Leslie he was going to finish off her mother first before coming back for her and Terry. Jake returned to the bedroom, and Leslie then heard her mother's screams. <sighs> Leslie wanted to help Sharon, but kept slipping in her own blood and falling. Weakened by her blood loss, Leslie crawled over to an area where the family stacked their empty beer bottles. She picked up a bottle to use as a weapon, intending to follow Jake into her mother's room and confront him there. What courage. Right. You can't think of anything else to do. What? You hear uh, mom crying, right? Like, you're going to want to help. Oh, God, what an amazing person. Terry cried out, for God's sake, get help. Thinking better of going after Jake, who was heavily armed, Leslie then ran out the front door to her neighbor's house. Jake, seeing her leave, gave chase. <sighs> Fortunately, the entrance to the neighbor's home wasn't locked, and Leslie was able to get inside slamming the door and locking it behind her. Out the window, Leslie observed Jake Green running away from the residence, hopping into the, a blue GMC Wrangler pickup truck he had borrowed and taking off. Leslie collapsed, and her neighbor's son went over to her parents' house, and the police and ambulance were called. Could you imagine being stabbed 33 or 36 times? I can't times? imagine being stabbed once, Scott. But, I mean, and like, and to, to be able to fight back... Mm. Well, you have to. And you, it's, it's well, but I just, at that point, I, it's instinct. I just, I just mean like I would expect my body to give out. Like I would expect to be dead. Your body <laughs> to give out. <laughs> Bone density is not helping me. Uh, but I, you know, that's I would. But like, you don't know. You're not a doctor. We don't know. Adrenaline does a lot in that absolutely. situation. Absolutely, I, I can attest to when I've broken legs and mm -hmm. stuff, and how you don't. I didn't feel a lot of pain in the moment. Yeah. But it's still like it's just amazing how strong people really are to be able to fight back and then to be able to leave, mm -hmm. still run, go to your like Be have the presence of mind to get out. And I get that that's what the body in, in those panic moments is built to do is just direct all energy, all of its strength into just surviving and mm -hmm. fleeing. Yep. But it just, it still blows me away Yeah, that your body took that amount of punishment and you could still function well enough to, right. it's just amazing. So we've forgotten somebody. Aaron McCory yeah. is still in the basement. I was wondering, yeah. He'd hidden there during the whole ordeal and now he was making his way upstairs. On his way up the stairway, he found one of Jake's bloody knives. Aaron discovered Sharon bloodied and badly wounded. She was on the phone with 911. She'd been stabbed 12 times. He found Terry Remco lying on his side trying to stop the, his own bleeding. Oh. This is another one of those, you don't know what, what you would do until you're in the situation yourself. And I hope I would bound in to rescue people. But you never know, right? Like, yeah, I, I, I'm sure Mr. McQuarrie has second-guessed himself thousands of times over the years. Yeah, I, I've learned to not make any judgments on someone in his situation or in these situations. Yeah. Because, yeah, you, we all like to think we'd be heroes and, and run up. But you don't know what he's hearing. You don't know what no. he's seeing. You don't know his experiences. Yeah. He might be like, he might recognize that if these three people couldn't stop him, how will I be? And if right. I'm dead, then who can go and help them? Yeah. You know, like, or you, he might just be like, oh, is the family fighting? Are they yelling and fighting? And I don't want to go and interrupt corrupt the family dispute you don't know and so i can't i can't pass can you imagine the guilt that that guy has to carry oh my god yeah like oh. like even though he he did what he did and it's it's not right or wrong what he did yeah what he did yeah like he preserved himself but at the same time we don't know what either of us would do it, even if in his own mind he knows what he did is right he is still ravaged by guilt because mm. you know okay well what i did was the best thing I could do, but people still got hurt. Yeah. Maybe I could have, yep. you know, the old could have, would have, so, should have. Yeah. Yeah. And so even if what you did, you feel confident was right, you're yeah. still going to be destroyed from guilt. So police spotted Jake in the pickup truck and started to pursue him. Good. The chase was slow at first. Jake was just ignoring the lights and sirens and all that kind of stuff. But quickly he sped up and the chase 
began to reach speeds of 160 kilometers per hour Shit. through Moose Jaw. Which is like seven miles an hour. No, that's like 100 miles an hour. Uh, it finally ended when Jake hit a curb, lost control, and careened into two parked vehicles in front of Grandma Lee's restaurant. Oh. Jake was relatively unhurt, save for some cuts and bruises. As he got out of the truck, the police approached. Jake, covered in the Uremko family's blood, told the cops that they would have to shoot him. But they just pepper sprayed him and took him down. They found a knife in the truck and three more he had used back at the Daisy Crescent residence. The Crown charged Jacob Leroy Andrew Green, 22, with three counts of attempted murder and one count of dangerous driving. What an intense, intense yeah. scene and experience. Very much so. And, you know, somebody could have been killed in this chase. Mm -hmm. it's, oh, know, it's, it's a Sunday morning, so luckily, probably on a Sunday morning in, in uh, Moose Jaw, there's not a lot all happening. It, all it takes is one child playing outside. Right? yeah. D dead. You know, I'll walk in along the sidewalk, yep. he loses control. Like, yeah, it doesn't take much for yeah. there to be a fatality in a but situation. But thank goodness like they got him, yeah. and they have him in custody. On May 14th, 2001... Jake Green entered a guilty plea on three counts of attempted murder and one count of dangerous driving. But due to his previous conviction for manslaughter, on top of the three other counts of attempted murder on the Uremcos, the Crown sought a declaration that he be designated a dangerous offender. Good. So much time yep. had taken, yep. you know, he had, obviously he'd murdered once and then he tried to do it three more times. Mm -hmm. This included imposition of an indeterminate sentence. So yep. if they yep. are able to find him a dangerous offender, he gets an indeterminate sentence. Yep. Jake fought the declaration, as anybody would, but the evidence of what he had done was horrific, and the assessments made by the court-appointed psychiatrist labeled Jake Green a remorseless psychopath. Jesus, yeah, that makes sense. Dr. Stanley Semrau, the Kelowna-based forensic psychiatrist we've mentioned in numerous episodes, mm -hmm. including episodes two and three about the Abbotsford killer, yeah, I recognize was that. the expert on the case. Mm -hmm. According to court documents, Dr. Semrau familiarized himself with the case, interviewed Jake at length, and submitted a written report. Semrau reported that, in his opinion, Jake Green suffered from a severe personality disorder. He felt that Jake presented a high risk for future serious violent offenses. Mm -hmm. Dr. Semrau said that the risks were highly unlikely to be significantly modified within the foreseeable future, either through treatment or aging or restraining measures. Yeah, and, and for those uh, in the States, and I don't know about the rest of the world, to be labeled a dangerous offender isn't done Willy nilly. No, there has to be a trial yeah, for that. Yeah, like it, as well. it, it's an incredibly serious because essentially you could be spending the rest of your life in jail for a non murder crime. Mm -hmm. um, so it's treated. There are sex offenders who are in. Absolutely. There's actually, I kind of want to do uh, a little bit more of a series on dangerous offenders. Mm. So that's why I labeled this dangerous offender. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because there are so many interesting dangerous offender yeah. stories in Canada. Yeah. That you, I guarantee, have never heard of. Oh, absolutely. Because yeah. A, they are sexual offenses and the victim's identities are protected. So, yeah. therefore, yeah. the perpetrator's identity is often protected yep. because they can't identify him because it may identify It could their... be a family member, could exactly. be a close friend. It would be easy to put the pieces together in a lot of situations. I, I read one article that said... There are 45 dangerous offender trials in Canada per year. Oh, shit, that's a lot. That is a lot. Yeah. So I'm that might have been an inflated number, and I'm uh, not entirely sure of it, but um, it, it does sound high. But at the same time, what I was reading in the, in the court documents that I was going through, there are a lot that I have never heard of, and there are some horrific crimes out there. Do any other countries have a dangerous offender yes. status? Yep, yeah, some do. Okay. Yeah. Just Google it. Because I'm, and I'm, there's a Wikipedia. I'll put a Wikipedia link yeah, in the yeah. show notes. Because I'm, I'm very glad that we have it. Yeah. Doctor Semrau stated that Jake Green spoke of the events at the Uremco home as quote just a little screw up. I just messed up. 
Wait a minute. Yes. So brutally stabbing three people, attempting to kill them. It was a little screw up. He I messed just, up. Messed, he just up. messed up. No, no, I'm sorry. I've like I've messed a few things up on occasion yeah. in my life. Yeah. Did had no stabbing. Yeah, involved. like I didn't paint the fence correctly once. Yeah, that's yeah. a little mess that's up. That's a little mess. That's up. a little mess up. I can Mike. fix that. Yeah. Did you stab people no, in the fence? No. Mm, see, big difference. So the doctor said that Jake was highly manipulative, exhibited a quote particularly cold, callous, and remorseless attitude towards his violent crimes and the victims, Mm -hmm. adding that the young man possessed a self-regarding arrogance and displayed a striking tendency to rationalize and justify his behavior. Which it goes to the psychopath component. The key to understanding Jake Green's violent behavior, Semrau reported, was, quote, the presence of a severe personality disorder with antisocial, narcissistic, and psychopathic features. Mm -hmm. Jake was suffering from a severe and malignant personality disorder. I hope that it is never on any paper about (laughs) my personality. Me as well, to go right next to I don't want killing to be a part of my job yeah. labeling. So. I'm sure narcissist is on both ours. Oh, at some extreme point. narcissism. He later added that persons with this disorder are not usually responsive to treatment. He also noted that this appeared accurate in Jake Green's case. Jake was convinced that he didn't need treatment because there was nothing wrong with him. He just made a little goof. I messed up. It was a little screw up. Just a little screw up, Mike. Cut him a break. Semrau then summed up as, as follows. Quote, it is thus likely that for the foreseeable future, Mr. Green's high risk of lethal violence can only be controlled by means of incarceration. Within a prison setting, Mr. Green is more likely to be well-behaved and to present himself, as he has in the past, much of the time, in a fairly positive light. The difficult challenge, then, will be to accurately assess whether the likely prolonged periods of relatively good behavior in custody are truly indicative of the kind of core personality change which would indicate the risk of reoffense upon community release. So good on Dr. Semrau. Yes. Uh, he's also saying, hey, parole board, be careful with this guy because you're not going to be able to tell if he's lying yeah, to you or well, not. That, that's the challenge. That right, we see the, it all the time. Okay. Uh, Alan Warren is about to release a new book mm, yep. about uh, David Shearing. Yep. Yeah, the Wells Gray Killer. And he actually gets to speak to Shearing. <sighs> so watch for that one, folks. I am, I'm looking. Also from court documents from the Crown's dangerous offender application in 2002, quote, The results of this senseless attack by Green on the Uremkos was catastrophic. Sharon had plastic surgery on her neck. Her sensory nerves were damaged, and she suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder. In her victim impact statement, Sharon says the physical pain is constant. Her shoulders, head, and neck will never improve. Her specialist says that perhaps massage therapy will make her more comfortable, but she will never be pain-free. The reason her jaw is so painful is that it was broken and the bone damaged by the knife wound to her face. Sharon requires a stabilizer brace inside her mouth and therefore will have to be treated by an oral surgeon. Also, further plastic surgery on the throat will be required. Sharon is now unable to work. Yeah, yeah. So that's the effect on one One person. One of these individuals. One. (sighs) Terry sustained permanent medical injuries from his encounter with Green, including the cutting of his spinal cord. Oh. That injury has left him with a continuous swollen and burning feeling in his foot and hand, which affect activities that he enjoys, such as golf, exercising, walking, and playing his guitar. A hearing cutting of the spinal cord just gives me shivers. Right. Oh. In his victim impact statement, Terry said that this senseless act destroyed every moral fiber of trust, security, and sense of well-being that he and his family had in living in the community. No kidding. Because of this, he was compelled to relocate his family to a location where they could try to feel safe and secure. Yeah. Like, there's the impact that you're having on somebody's life, and you don't, you made a little screw up. And it's just not physical. Right. It is equally, if not more so, mental damage. Well, the physical is horrific. Yep. And, but the, yes, but the, you the know, mental it, is also m- just as horrific. More often than not, with a lot of injuries, they will heal physically. 
uh, not with the, these, a lot of these are permanent. I'm just saying in, in life in general, but the brain, you can't just put a band aid on no. or give it stitches or put it in a cast. It's been treated for PTSD for one reason or another, yeah. and it's not fun. No. The 2002 document continued. Leslie is no longer gainfully employed. The only income she receives is her Canada pension disability allowance. In her impact statement, Leslie says that physically she suffers every day. Her hands hurt when she tries to use them, as does her chest and abdomen when she takes a deep breath. Leslie also suffers from cramps to her neck. Because of these injuries, Leslie will be unable to continue her employment as a conductor at the railway a position which she found challenging and enjoyable, oh, end quote. That's a really cool job. Yeah. Oh. It's sad. Yeah, I, God, I just, please tell me, and I know you don't have the answer, but please, I'm saying it to, like, to Canada, like, please tell me there are other financial support for people like this. Because a pension, your pension's not going to be much. I don't think And, are. you know, you've got to qualify for disability and stuff I like that. I know people that. who like, are on disability who don't make a lot of money and even for sure especially right now yeah for sure I, i'm just saying there's got to be like more than just one because it's just like that is just if that is how it is in, in our country or any other country it's fucked because to be you were by no control of your own rendered incapable to properly function in this society and we're going to add to that by making you not really be able to afford to live. Right. Like, that just doesn't seem right. Leslie Yuremko's victim impact statement was powerful. It read as follows, mm -hmm. quote, September 26, 1999 was the most horrifying day of my life. I woke to my family being butchered. The physical pain inflicted that day was immense. The emotional pain was worse. Exactly. Imagine lying on the floor of your own kitchen in your own blood, looking at the man who put you there as he takes out another knife, looks you in the eye, and tells you he's going to finish your mother off first. Can you imagine trying to struggle off the floor and try to try and stop him? But you can't because you're slipping and falling down in your own blood. When you're able to finally get up, you have to make the decision to stay in the house and try to help or leave the house and go get help, not knowing how bad everyone really is not knowing if they're dead or alive. Put yourself in my place in the hospital, begging the staff to tell you how your parents are, and when they won't tell you anything, just not to worry about them right now. I thought they were dead. Then I hear them bring my mom in, and they tell me she needs emergency surgery because her throat's been slit. He cut her jugular vein and slashed her windpipe. They didn't know if she'd make it. Still, they won't tell me about my dad. Hours later... I finally saw my dad. I saw him laying on a gurney in emergency, not able to move, his face slashed up and gaping, and most of his body looking the same way. At that point, I didn't think I'd ever been so upset in my life. I started to cry and apologize. It was my fault that my parents were hurt. Because of me, this man knew where we lived. I had brought him there in the past. She continues, Watching my parents suffer has been the hardest thing I've ever had to do, They've been in so much pain physically and emotionally. There are days when I wish I could have all their wounds that I would have died to save them their pain. And finally, she says, he took that away from me. In so many ways, he took my life. My life has been completely changed. I miss being me. I miss being carefree and happy without any real worries. I grieve for what is never to be now. I grieve for what I had. My life is now completely on a blind path. There is no real security in any way. He may not have physically killed me, but I'll never be the same person that I used to be. I constantly look over my shoulder, and I'm afraid this could happen again. I'm scared that this man will be out in society again. I'm afraid that if he does get out of jail, that he will try to finish what he started. He did this to my family because I had not wanted to date him for a while. That is what he did over something as trivial as that, end quote. A five-week relationship. So, it, you know what is most concerning about this? I guarantee you, because I'm hearing that, and I'm emotional. Yeah. I'm emotional. I guarantee you, when he heard that, he felt nothing. 
Maybe not, no. I, I'm sure he felt not. He's a psychopath. I'm sure he felt like, oh, it's not a, that big of a deal. You're all alive. Like, that's the most disturbing part is yeah. that he, how can somebody hear that and just be like, hey, there's a little screw up. Well, for guys like him, the victim impact statement isn't for him. It's for the courts. Yes. Right. Yeah. That's, so a, the that's, courts very, can, that's a good point. Yeah. So the courts can actually make the decisions yeah. that they have to make. Yeah, that's a good point. So as a result, the Crown's application was approved and Jake Green was declared a dangerous offender and sentenced to an indeterminate sentence. Jake appealed and in 2004, that appeal was denied and the Yuremko family must have been relieved. Suck it, dill bag. Yeah. Jesus. We hope that the Yuremkos continue to heal and have been able to find a sense of normalcy in the years since, but I don't... Think, I don't, yeah. Yeah. Leslie Yuremko, who appears to share two mutual friends with me on Facebook, oh. posted a picture of white text on a black background in September 2020. Actually, she posted it yesterday when I wrote this, when I was oh, writing wow. this. It says, my biggest regrets in life are being too damn nice, apologizing when I didn't do anything wrong, and making unworthy people a priority. I really hate that somebody has to be in a position where a big regret is that they're too nice because that means some piece of shit took advantage of that. And we wish you well, Leslie, if oh, you're listening yes. to the show. Uh, people like you inspire uh, people like us and i um, just blown away by your strength. And I'm so glad you guys are alive. And that's it for this week's show. Uh, you can find more in our show notes on darkpoutine.com. That was a doozy, Mike. Right. You pulled that one out of nowhere. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. It was, uh, it was actually a tough one to write. I bet. Because uh, knowing victim impact, like there's more of that kind of stuff. Oh, I, yeah. And reading those things, uh, it's, it's quite, uh, quite upsetting that yeah, somebody, yeah. somebody did that to people. Yeah. And. Um, By good, to good people. Yeah. Just. Uh, yep. Yeah. I guess it's time for voicemails. Oh, <laughs> Let, let's do that. So I can get off this roller coaster now? We can get off oh the roller coaster. Oh, my God. The twists and turns. Well, and there might be twists and, and turns on the, uh, <laughs> the voicemail. Yeah, this is true. You never know. I don't. No. I don't. It could be. Yeah. This could be amazing or it could be like horrific. We should do like a whole <laughs> separate podcast of just reading the, the translations of what of the, the voicemails because they're like it's you guys would be blown away by how bad the trans like a lot of the times you're like oh this is nothing like what what i thought what 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 the person actually said yeah all right uh let's give this one a go it looks like it's about 46 seconds long oh, so perfect hi mike and scott this is melanie levois i am calling from cape Royal, ontario it's a small town just north of sudbury I just want to thank you guys for an amazing educational podcast. Mike, I love the sound of your voice and all the historical tidbits you leave behind. You have increased my Canadian literature by quite a lot. <laughs> God, man, oh, man, are you ever the cheese to Mike's Putsin? You make me laugh in every single episode, and that's just so fantastic of you. Oh, you make it great. You make it great. Anyways... Never change. Bye. At this oh. point in our lives, it, it, there's no changing. Oh, merci. Yeah. Wow. wow. That was very, that very was sweet. Very kind. That was very, very sweet. And, and, and she pronounced Putin correctly, she went, so she's clearly she from a, a Le Francais yeah. part of uh, Ontario. Yeah, but oh. that oh, that was really kind and sweet. Yeah. And I just, I, it's so clear that a lot of people who leave voicemails have scripted it like and i get it because it's just like it can be a uh, terrifying thing to do and it's just, a terrifying yeah. thing to do a show yeah right and so uh That's why but i here. just i just love <laughs> i just love how like the our listeners put that that much thought into like the it means enough to them to actually make sure they've got what they they have something they want to say and get yeah. it out to us that's just really i'm blown away uh, let's look at another one here. This looks like uh, this person might be Melissa. We'll, we'll, we'll find out. Yeah, probably not at all. Yeah. 
How's she going there, Scott and Mike? Melissa here from a small town in the Ottawa Valley region. Love listening to your podcast. I'm a huge true crime fan, and I started with the Canadian True Crime and Minds of Madness podcast, and one of those did a shout-out to you guys. So I started listening, and as, as soon as I heard the loon and you mentioned the double-double, it made me feel at home. Keep up the great work, and love how cozy and homey you make this podcast feel. See you later. So it was Melissa. It wasn't Melissa. Yeah, it wasn't wow, Melissa. Well, the translate got it right. Well, thank you, Melissa. And and that was my goal when we started this. I wanted it to have that homey down home, that down home yeah. feel to yeah. it. And uh, it, it totally seems to be translating. And uh, we appreciate the feedback. We certainly do. Especially the positive ones. <laughs> Those are the only <laughs> yeah, ones we're going to play. Yeah. Just so you know, if you call and you're a douche. It's not uh, going it's, home. It's, you're not like, going to like it. You'll never hear it. If you want to just And call, we probably won't hear it either. We'll because, make it a few seconds. We could tell. Unless you make it long and then at the end you're like, and you suck. That's, you might sneak it in then. But not onto the show, but into us listening to it. But if it starts off with like, hey guys, love the show. Got some concerns though. Really not. Play, click. Yeah. Look, we have three in a row from Ontario. Let's try oh. this one. Whoa, oh, oh. whoa. Hey there, uh, I'm Sarah and I'm from the Toronto area. I've only been listening to you guys for a little while now, but I'm excited to play some catch up for sure. Um, I work for Disney as my regular job, so naturally my day is filled with rainbows and butterflies, which is great, um, but I have a dark side too. So let's just say your podcast balances me out. Um, but despite being fascinated by crime stories, I'm actually terrified of most of the types of criminals that you guys discuss in your stories. So I decided to face that fear head on and educate myself and your podcast has been the perfect way to do so. So um, I also volunteer as a crisis responder for Crisis Text Line. So I just wanted to say that I'm so appreciative of your suggestion um, of using that service because it really is legitimately a great tool to help bring some peace to people. And I just think that's so great, so thank you. Anyways, I'm a very proud Canadian but I do admire that you guys are always keeping it real and educating your listeners that bad things happen in Havens too. So um, thank you again. You guys are so awesome. I can't wait to continue listening. And I just keep hearing that I'm supposed to say, go shit in your hats. Um, not exactly sure where that all came from, but I guess I will find out when I'm playing catch up. <laughs> there it is. Thank you guys. Have a great day. Bye. <laughs> well, That's thank awesome. You. And, and, and rest assured, uh, we're also very, very uh, concerned about a lot of the people we cover as well. Yeah. And, I mean, amazing that you're, you're volunteering at the crisis line. I, I volunteer every year my photography, which isn't to say much to the children's uh, network, the children's uh, kids' help phone. So uh, what you're doing is just fantastic. Thank you. Yes, we really appreciate that. Um, and I, I thought that was the best way for us to steer people towards yeah. something if they need help that's a great way to get they help. are so valuable and so helpful and by the way folks crisis text line doesn't pay us a penny for us saying that for uh, for my blurb about it on every show i just think that it's an important service that canadians and everybody else should take advantage yes. of if they need help yes and here's our last one this looks like it's from outside of canada whoa uh oh whoa. Let's, let's have a listen Hello, Mike and Scott. This is Mila calling from Idaho Springs, Colorado. I'm a former Texan, and I escaped up to the mountains earlier this year. I've been listening to Dark Routine almost since the beginning, and I love the Yumber Yard. And I thought that y'all might like to hear that I successfully turned several coworkers who claimed they were not fans of true crime onto your podcast purely due to your delightful banter. I so appreciate y'all's sense of humor and your honesty in talking about both mental health and sobriety. I am celebrating eight months sober this month, and I couldn't be happier, and it's so refreshing to hear you both sharing your experience and normalizing seeking, mental health, seeking help for mental health issues. Uh, anyway, thank you both so much for putting in the hard work to bring us all these fascinating true crime stories. Bye. Well, there you go. That just really... Congrats on your uh, sobriety anniversary. That's awesome. Like, that really just put everything meaningful and powerful into one voicemail. Right. That that's, was That's just, why we do what we do. Yeah, that is just, and, and, yeah, and huge congrats on, on eight months of sobriety. Believe me, uh, Mike knows firsthand, I know secondhand, the challenges 
yeah. and difficulty in that. And so I am uh, lucky to be alive. Yeah. So a huge eight months is a massive achievement. So yeah, one, very, day, one day is a massive achievement. Yeah. Yeah. So very proud of you. And, and thank you so much for the amazing support. There you go. And turning on new people to us. Awesome. So if you want to leave us a voicemail, you can do so at one 327 5786 or one 877 I wish I could have gotten dark poutine as like all one thing, but I couldn't. Somebody had it? No, it doesn't exist. Oh, uh, boo. If your call stands out, you might hear it on the show. And again, if it's negative, you won't. Right, yeah. You de- just won't. Deal with it. Yeah, like it, who would do that? Who would be like, what, what a terrible That lady scheming. from Alberta. Well, but, but I mean, no, I mean like who, what podcaster would put that on the show? Here's a scathing, criticizing, terrible voicemail. Yes, I'm going to, yeah, absolutely. Let's, let's put this let's on. Let's pl- play it because let's somebody hates us. Let's play that on the air. No, yeah. that's just, it's not going to happen. Deal with it. And guess what? This phone is not monitored. I'm not answering it. <laughs> we don't ever answer the phone. Like it You're, does yeah. actually ring. It rang in yeah. the middle of us doing that this. That would have, that would yeah. have been. Uh, yeah. Our person from Idaho Springs yeah. there. But, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, just like, yeah, deal with it. That's what the internet is for. You can complain because that's what everybody does there. Yeah. The internet is a great place to complain. Just give us a good review. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) You can say bad things as long as you five star it. (laughs) Say the most awful thing. But five star. Give us a five star review. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Why not? I don't like shilling for reviews. I don't do it. I, I I just feel weird about it. it. It feels anytime you have to ask for something like that, it feels very inauthentic. Yeah, like I don't want to feel disingenuous. I, I and want just like I, want I feel pe- skeevy. Like oh, absolutely. Like, I want. I'm Larry. I'm I'm uh, I'm uh, what was the name? Herb Tarlick. <laughs> Yeah. Selling you a selling you like a, a car that you don't yeah. need. Yeah. No. I, I if people are going to say nice things, I would just like them to do it because that's how they feel. Not no. not not because we're like please like us. <laughs> Having said that, please like us. Right. All righty. Uh, let's get to some. Uh, oh oh oh! Patreon time. Huh? Yeah, it's Patreon oh. time. It's time for our Patreon shout out. Don't Patreonize me, Mike. Well, we want people to Patreonize oh, us. Oh, Patreonize us, everybody. Right, exactly. Yes. If you don't Patreonize us, we won't know uh, that you love us. We'll just feel sad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we don't want to feel sad. We've done that a lot and enough of right? our lives. I've, yeah, <laughs> I'm pretty good at feeling sorry for yeah, myself. Yeah, yeah. We don't want that. So first up. We have a new eager beaver, oh! and it's Patricia McKenzie. Hi, Patricia. And she is from... Grimsby, Ontario. Mm-hmm. What does uh, Patricia or Pat yep. do in Grimsby? She uh, uh, finds okay misused uh, garden gnomes. Okay. And no, don't don't go oh. don't don't harken back to that. She, that. she if she if Patricia, now that you're a five dollar patron, you can go and listen to the garden gnome episode. I, you know, uh, maybe not because your profession is really might sully it. Yeah, right. So that's not where I was going. Yep. She finds like old abandoned garden gnomes. Oh, that's nice. She fixes them up. You know, puts a fresh coat of paint on them. Wow, and just beautifies them and then resells them on Etsy. Well, there you go. You know, that might actually nice. be a pretty... That is actually a pretty good thing. Yeah. I just go around and steal the garden gnomes to sell. Well, but then it's, then it's not right. Well, right, something not right and actually doing it, you know. That's true. Yeah. yeah that's it, true. There is no good nor bad. Only thinking makes, makes it so, Shakespeare. Wow. Well, that's, that's that but so she's, a, they call it a gnomer. She's a gnomer. Okay. Yeah. Next we have Saria Duncan. Oh, and she is from another Idaho Falls, but this is in Idaho. Oh. Rather than Colorado. Well, that that does make sense as to where an Idaho Falls should be. Okay. In Idaho. Yeah. Yeah. Does, you know. Right. Yeah. So what does she do? Uh well, what what she does is in Idaho, she doesn't uh she doesn't grow potatoes, she doesn't pick potatoes. Right. She's not related to the potato industry in that sense. Right. What she does do she works in a potato peeler manufacturing plant. Oh, so she works. She's part of the industry. I gotcha. She's part of the potato so industry. So she makes potato I peelers. I mean, it's a lucrative industry. They have a lot of potatoes in Idaho. I always think about those old 
uh, shows, those old movies where they put the guy who was bad in the yeah, army. Yeah, in the army. Peeling yeah. potatoes. Yeah. Uh, Corporal Smith, go peel some potatoes. It's like, oh, darn it. Yeah, exactly. You mean I don't have to get shot? Great. <laughs> I'll be peeling potatoes. I'm going to misbehave like there's no tomorrow. <laughs> I'm like Klinger. <laughs> but I guess you couldn't be that character anymore. No. I don't think we can do Klinger anymore. No. Because it... it I mean, but, but yes, but it would have to have a very different angle to it. Yeah. Um, yeah it's interesting. There's yeah. a lot of characters now that uh, oh, wouldn't yeah. wouldn't fly. Yeah, it's called, all, uh, what was it, All in the Family? Uh, Archie Bunker? Yeah. Archie Bunker actually probably would be a good character right now because <sighs> he is so racist and blatantly so, and it's he is marketed I, as that. I don't think in a comedic sense, though. I think in like in a dr- dr- dramatic sense, yeah, that character could have a lot yeah. of weight. Well, next up from Las Vegas. Hey, hey. But why does it say California? But maybe well, she's, I don't know. it's the states. They're changing things up so, constantly. Las Vegas. We have a new a prime minister. Oh, Amy Urban. Amy Urban. Is, is that Keith Urban's daughter? Maybe. Oh God, I hope so. That would be amazing. Oh my God. Any of the Urbans, if they're listening. Right, so would that be like Nicole Kidman's daughter too? But I don't think they have biological kids together, do they? Well, I don't know. I don't know either. Let's find a Amy. Tell us. Yeah, please, please let She's us. She's got that PM money, so she <laughs> might, she might be Keith Urban's <laughs> girl, yeah. little girl. It, yeah, that that would just be wow. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah, but uh, so what does what does Amy do? Sadly, not related to the urbans. Oh no, uh, to those urbans. I got gotcha. you. Anyways, but she does work in a, in an appropriate field. What's that? She works at Urban Outfitters. Oh great! Yeah, yeah. yeah. What she do there? Just like a salesperson. She'll, sell, she'll sell you. Yeah, some, good for you. She'll sell you some khakis. There if you, you need go. Them. Do you need khakis? Uh, I do probably. Well, Amy, I've lost a bunch of weight, so Amy Urban's ready to hook you up. Thanks, Amy. Some khakis. Some fresh khakis. And thank you for becoming a PM. Yeah. We yeah, really appreciate it. We do. Uh, next up, we have uh, a new loony. <gasps> oh. And it's Dave Casanelli. Okay. And we don't know where Dave's from. Uh, from Guatemala City in... Guatemala. Guatemala. Oh, wow. Yes. I was pretty good at that. You, you nailed that one. And what does Dave Casanelli do? Dave is not one of the Daves you know you know. He is not. These are the Daves I know. Uh, what Dave does is Dave... Uh, is a uh, works building high rise buildings. Oh, okay. So yeah. is he like a he's like a, he's a, a an a, iron worker, a, an iron worker. Yes. Okay. I was gonna say steel person, but iron worker. Makes right. More, iron worker is the the actual name. Yeah. 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 He, steel person. He's a steel yeah, person. You know, he does the stuff with the steel. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so he doesn't like steel thing. No, so he'll be. He's like at the top, oh, you know, like seventy stories. And does he eat a sandwich on a like <laughs> on an exactly. eye beam? It's all he does. Oh, yeah, that's that's <laughs> his sandwich. That's his role. He, uh, the the eye beam that's hanging out over the side yeah. of the construction. He just sits there and eats sandwiches. Wow, and he's just he's really there for photo opportunities. Well, thanks, Dave, thank for you, Dave. becoming a patron. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we really appreciate that. How do we ever? We really do. We certainly do. Next. We have, uh oh, oh, this is this is another eager beaver. Oh my! This God. is Coral Dalzel. Oh, what a cool name! And she's from Sioux Lookout, Ontario. Oh wow! Yeah. How how do you think they came up with that name? Was it like like there was like somebody named Sue was walking down no, the street and they're like Sue, look out! It's as the indigenous folk Sue. It's spelled that way. Oh, so it's not no. Like a rock was going to hit her. No. And somebody else, Sue, oh, look out! A rock! Had that been the full sentence, it would have been called Sue, look out, a rock. Well, so what does Coral do in Sue, look out? C- coral. Um, and don't say she finds coral in the sea because there's no coral there's in no, Ontario. No, no, there's no ocean in Ontario. Exactly. Uh, but you never know with you. Well, this is this is a fair point. No, uh, Coral um, is an animator. Oh. Yeah, she works in animation. Wow. Yeah. What yeah. has she worked on any shows that I might know? Uh I don't Ren know. And Stimpy? I, I'm not I'm not too sure. Have you ever heard of The Simpsons? A couple of times. Yeah. She's yeah, I'm I'm vaguely familiar with it. She's the lead animator on The Simpsons. She's been doing it for thirty years. Oh wow. Yeah. 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 So yeah. Oh well, good. Look for her name in the credits. There you go. Yeah. Sue, look out. Sue, look out. Uh all right. Next up we have some PayPal. Oh, do we? Donut Money Donors. Do we now? Okay, fr- first up, from 
<laughs> from the UK. Oh, God. Our friend Sally Norris is sending us some more donut money. Sally, you are awesome. Sally, but don't bankrupt. She must like to hear her name on don't, the show. Don't bankrupt yourself or anything. Right? Don't, oh my don't God. do that for us. My God, do it, but don't. She's got like two little donut emojis there, and then she says, Mike and Scott, many thanks as always. Sally N. Weymouth, UK, United Kingdom. Mm-hmm. Could you please, please, please do me a huge favor and say hello to a fellow Yumber Yarder who I was chatting to last week. She actually recognized me from all the shout outs you give me. So I'd love to have her have one too. Her name is Terry Inglis. Well, hi, Terry, Terry Inglis. Inglis. Welcome. And I think she's also in the UK. Well, look at that. That is so cool. Terry Inglis. There you go. Thank you, Sally Norris. And Thank and you Sal- both Terry. so much again. Stay safe. Stay well. Occupation professional name dropper. Well, you know what? Hmm. Um, we've talked about what Sally Norris does. Mm-hmm. For a living, numerous yep. times, yes, and probably given her a number of different jobs, a yeah. lot of Chuck, a lot involved. of Chuck Norris. Yeah. But what does Terry Inglis do? Oh, Terry Inglis, that's a great question. I only <laughs> recently met her. Oh, okay, like now. Yeah. So you're shoveling baloney again? No, but it's a good thing that I've heard of who she is. Okay. So I'm a, I'm very well aware of what she does. She works for the CBC, which I don't know if you're aware, Mike, is a Canadian broadcast. I am quite aware. I am wearing actually a CBC oh, shirt oh, look right at that. Now. What a coincidence. Hmm. What a coincidence. She works for the CBC. Yeah. She is a... Uh, a CBC in the UK. Yes. So it would not be the BBC, Scott. No, 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 no. They have. Oh, she's a CBC uh, correspondent. Yes. Oh, yeah, there you, you go. You get it. Yes. So uh, Terry Inglis is a CBC correspondent, and yep. what, what show? What has she reported on? Oh, you may have heard of Brexit. Oh yeah. Yeah, she she yeah. reported. She she was the first person to find out about Brexit. Yeah. And she broke it to the Canadian Broadcasting. You know what I think of whenever I think of Brexit. Buffoonery? Breakfast. Oh. I want my breakfast right now. I want like a cornflakes. I think something. of a, a wheat crisp, which is terrible. A Weetabix. Yes. That's why. That's yeah, it. That's why go. I think of that, mm. te- which is terrible. Well, thank you, Sally. And hello to your friend, Terry Inglis. That's right. And our friend. Now, yeah. Well, she is a Yumbri artist. That's so right. She's already our friend. That's right. Uh, next we have Dakota Harrington. Oh, boy. Sorry about the Canucks, boys. Yeah. You guys had a great season and a lot to look forward to in the future. Dakota, the Brand- Bruins fan from D- Vermont. Well, you know what, Ash, that's that's a kind. There was no like not stabbing involved right. with that. That was a genuine. Yeah. And thank you. It was the. It was actually. A, I'm very proud of that run. I'm sad that we didn't uh, continue forward, but it was actually really. It was a really fun series, a uh, couple series that we had. And I, it was a great playoff run. I enjoyed it. It was, uh, all except for the riot. We didn't riot this oh, time. Oh, yeah, the one with the Boston, though. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Woo! Oui. Yeah. Uh, here's one from Danielle Samson Lemke. Oh. And she says, you guys are wonderful. Thank you for being my quarantine soundtrack smiley face. Oh, well, thank you, Danielle. Oh, and, uh, what does Danielle do for a living? Oh, Danielle, I I know exactly uh, oh, what okay. Danielle yep. does. I spit it out. Yeah, I'm, well, I'm going to. This exactly, I'm here to do that, to spit that out. Okay, so I'm going to spit it out. I can smell you thinking. Yeah, it's that's you know the gears are grinding. Right. Uh, she happens to work for um, Pabst Beer. Whoa. Yeah. She Perhaps worked. like the blue ribbon. Yeah. Yeah. Like, a, no, that I'm thinking of something else. I don't know where you were going, but no. no. I was going to do an uh, an insurance ad. Yeah, don't. Yeah. No. That has nothing to do with Pabst, Pabst Blue beer. Ribbon. Yeah. No. Does she drive like, does she help to paste the the logo onto NASCAR cars and stuff like that? She does not. No. Oh, okay. And no, no. She just works on the conveyor belt line. Oh, she's a taster. Well, not officially, but she <laughs> certainly does, Mike. Uh-oh. Yeah. I might have to take her to uh, yeah, one her, of those anonymous if meetings. You, if you've had a Pabst, you've probably got her DNA. Oh, there you in, go. In, ingested her DNA. Well, there yeah. you go. Yeah. Well, thank you, Daniel. <laughs> thank you very much. I haven't had a Pabst for a long time, so it's very Good that uh, Pap- Pabst mirror. I know that's uh, disgusting. Yeah. Uh, next we have Megan Beatty. Oh, hi Megan Beatty. Yeah, we know her too. Um, a little donut money 
in thanks for the anti-incel rant in the last episode. It warmed my soul. Much love to you both from Ontario. You cons- you consistently brighten my week, and both of you bring so much to these tragic but, tragic but important stories. Stay safe, Megan. Oh, wow. Oh, trust me, we've got incel rants for days. Oh, my gosh, do Fuck we ever. those losers. I still want to do an after show about incels. I, I, we, I think we really should. We really because should. Because I loathe them Mm -hmm. and i need a platform to go off yeah let's just go off about incels at some point yeah and now that people are you know eager beavers and those kind of things they can hear that that's right yeah yeah Yeah, hear us go off about incels because just (laughs) what that's just the saddest bunch of idiots ever yeah well there you go um thank you to all our patrons and donut money donors past and present for your help to keep us doing what we do if you want to show your support of dark dark poutine you can subscribe at patreon.com slash dark poutine or for one-time donation you can send us donut money via P- paypal at our email address dark poutine podcast at gmail.com if you don't already subscribe to the show it mean a lot to us if you did you can easily find us an itunes podcast stitcher tune in spotify or wherever you get your on-demand audio mm. check out our website darkpoutine.com for show notes and other cool stuff Please take the time to give Dark Poutine a like or a follow on Facebook and Instagram. It'd be great to see those numbers creeping up. Most importantly, thank you for listening and tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. Until we return, don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Bye-bye, everybody. What? Hey, Bobby, why am I <laughs> such a bad egg? I think, I think you should be a good egg. I used to do a great impression of him. Well, <laughs> See you later, folks. Bye-bye. Hi, it's Shauna, and I might be a bad parent because my kids think french fries are vegetables. Hey, it's Ryan, and I might be a bad parent because I went out for wings when my wife was in the hospital after giving birth. Johnny here. I might be a bad parent because in my house, the tooth fairy gives pocket change. But we're not alone. Len emailed us and said his six-year-old daughter's Tarzan moment going from love seat to lazy boy by curtains made him more proud than any dance (laughs) recital. (laughs) And Andy left his two-year-old at the rink. All right, guys, I'm sure we're not alone, like Andy's kid. For stories and confessions like this, make sure you check out our podcast. It's called Bad Parents, and it's available wherever you get your podcasts. I left a glove at the rink.